Hello, there's no two ways about it. If you want to get started in games programming, you're going to need to know some mathematics. But it's not all doom and gloom. As I have demonstrated many times on this channel, you can achieve some really cool stuff by just understanding a core set of mathematical functions and operations. The recent videos on the channel this year have been a little bit more complicated than usual, and this has prompted quite a few of you to ask the question, what maths do I need to know in order to be a games programmer? Well, I hope this video goes some way to answering your question. So I'm going to start with something that's really fundamental, and that's Pythagoras' theorem. And as games developers, we'll be using this all over the place. And it works with right-angled triangles. Now, a right-angled triangle means that one of the angles is 90 degrees. And that's really important, and we'll see this a lot in this video. If I label the sides of the triangle in the following way, so here we've got A, and B and C, Pythagoras' theorem links together the lengths of these three sides. And there's an easy way to remember this relationship. It's as follows. We have C squared equals A squared plus B squared, which means if we know the length of A and we know the length of B, we can calculate the length of C, which is known as the hypotenuse. With some simple algebra, we can rearrange this to be C is equal to the square root of A squared plus b squared. Calculating the length of c is quite an important thing in game development. Let's for example assume we're working on a two-dimensional game and we represent our screen as a pair of x and y axes. So here I've got x and here I've got y. This of course then is our origin, 0, 0. Now let's say I have two points on my screen and I wanted to calculate the distance between the two points. One of these points, for example, could be the player and the other point could be the enemy. Perhaps when the player is close enough to the enemy, the enemy's response changes. So knowing this distance becomes a critical form of gameplay manipulation. But all we have are the two points. So here we've got uh, P1X and P1Y and here we've got P2X and P2Y. If we form a right angled triangle out of those two points, then we could say that B is equal to P2Y take P1Y. It gives us the difference between the two points. And likewise, we could say that A is equal to P2X take P1X, which gives us the distance in the X axis. Therefore, we can substitute into our formula to determine the length C c equals the square root of, and it's going to be a long one, p2x take p1x squared plus p2y take p1y, also squared. In principle, it doesn't matter whether we do p2 take p1 or p1 take p2. All c is is the distance between the two points, and that distance, well, it's just a fixed scale of value. So whether we look at it from the player's perspective or from the enemy's perspective doesn't make any difference. Once we know this distance, we can make assumptions. So for example, if C is less than or equal to 50, that might be some unit in our game space, then attack. Whenever we're working with two-dimensional games, we'll always be working with an X and Y axis like this. And it's important that the X and Y axis are at 90 degrees to each other. And this is enforced by the layout of the screen and the layout of our arrays in memory. So it's very natural to think of things uh, in a two-dimensional system such as this. And even though we didn't specify a triangle explicitly, we could derive a triangle just from these coordinates in the 2D space. And this is a principle which we'll keep coming back to time and time again throughout this video. If you're going straight into three-dimensional games or four-dimensional games or 27th dimensional games, uh, you can simply add more terms to this as required, where each term represents a distance along one of your world's axes. The next area of essential mathematics that you'll need to know about for game development is vectors, and I do not mean standard vector. This is not what I'm talking about. They are not the same thing. Let's take an axis again. And somewhere on my axis, I have a point. We know that the coordinates of that point is defined by its location along both of those axes. So here will be its x-coordinate, and here will be its y-coordinate. And we can happily represent this position, let's say it's P, 
as being x, y. On the one hand, this point is just a point in 2D space, but we can also consider it as being a distance travelled from the origin. So starting at 0, 0 and going to our point P. If we always assume it starts from the origin, we never need to include that anywhere. So the only information we need is the location of the point. When we think about things in this way, what we have described is a vector. And vectors are quite important because not only do they describe a point in space, but they also describe a direction. Our vector can point in any direction and be any length long. When we want to describe a vector, we usually see a little arrow above the letter we're using to describe it. And it's convention to use a column of parameters to specify the point part of the vector. So in this case, we know that our point was at x and y. So in the literature, if you start to see this notation, you know you're going to be working with vectors. The key thing to remember is a vector has a length and a direction. Now, how do you think we calculate the length of a vector? Well, hopefully it's already obvious that what we have created here is a right angle triangle. And if we know these two sides, and we do, this one is y and this one is x, then we can use Pythagoras' theorem to calculate the length of this vector. The length of a vector is also known as its magnitude. So here is our vector, and usually you'd put two bars uh, either side of the symbol to represent the magnitude or the length of the vector. And we know now that that is simply Pythagoras' theorem. Vectors can be added and subtracted. So let's say I get to this point and I then use another vector to define another point. And let's say I do it again. This time we have a vector, quite a long one, going this way. And one more time, why not? Big long vector going over here. I'll label my vectors v1, v2, v3 and v4. We always assume that a vector in isolation starts at the position 0, 0. And when we add vectors together, we assume there's a little 0, 0 just here. And then there'll be another little 0, 0 just here. And up here. Adding vectors is very simple. If we wanted to work out the location of this final point over here, we can add up all of the vectors on this path to give us that point. And therefore we can say that P is equal to V1 plus V2 plus V3 plus V4. To add the vectors, don't forget these will each have their own sets of X and Y's, we add together the common components of each vector. So it becomes X plus X plus X and Y plus Y plus Y plus y, which will give us the position of our point as a vector. And this holds true because this is still, it's a point in 2D space, but it is still a vector, starting from the origin. So let's assume we have a player character which is walking along a path, and it visits all of these points. We can describe in two dimensions that path quite nicely with vectors. We can also sum the lengths of each vector to see how far the player has walked by working out the magnitude of each vector as we go along. And after we've walked along that path, because we've got a resultant vector P, we can work out the length of that vector, which will tell us how far we are from our starting position. The important thing to remember about vectors is they are a length and a direction. But what do we do if we don't care about the length of the vector? And really, all we're interested in is the direction. So we're going to lose this scalar value of the vector. Well, there's no such thing as removing the length. The best we can do is assume that the length is 1. And vectors that have a length of 1 are a unique type of vector. They're called a unit vector. And we'll see later in this video that there's quite a few properties of unit vectors we can exploit to our advantage. The nice thing is any normal vector can be converted to a unit vector through a process called normalizing. Fundamentally, our vector is a right angle triangle. And I've already shown that the magnitude or length of a vector is calculated by Pythagoras' theorem. If we assume the original length of our vector was 10, but we want to represent it as a unit vector, its length must become 1. The direction remains the same. But this has, of course, changed 
our x and y values. They've become smaller. And due to the proportionality effects of right-angled triangles, this has in fact become x divided by 10, and this has become y divided by 10. They've become one-tenth of their original size. The hypotenuse will have become one-tenth of the original size, and therefore the sides of the triangle must also reduce by a factor of 10. This means if we can calculate the length of our original vector and divide that vector's components by the length, we can establish the unit vector, which has a length of 1. The notation for a unit vector has a little hat over the top, or a chevron. And therefore we can also imply now, although you won't see this written out very often, that the unit vector consists of components x divided by the square root of x squared plus y squared, and y divided by exactly the same thing. And therefore by taking our vector, dividing its individual components by the length of that vector, we end up with our unit vector. This has a magnitude or a length of 1, and of course it still has direction. And it's this direction that we're interested in. If we always assume the length is 1, all that's left is the direction, the only interesting feature of this vector. Unit vectors have many uses, but perhaps the most obvious one is that they can be scaled very simply. Let's say I wanted to find a point along the direction of my vector, but that point must be, and let's just pick a number for the sake of argument, uh, 8.3 in length away from the origin. Instead of doing any complicated calculations, we can simply multiply our unit vector by 8.3, because multiplying 1 by 8.3 is equal to, well, 8.3, and the direction is still the same. So this point here we could define as being p equals our unit vector v multiplied or scaled by 8.3. Unit vectors in games are great for specifying direction. So here I've got a crude car, and if I assume that the center of the car is lying at the origin, I can represent the direction the car is traveling in as a unit vector. The distance that the car travels, I can just represent as, well, the distance, a scalar value. I don't need to know the direction. The direction is included in this unit vector. The distance is what will scale the unit vector by to work out where the car is in the future. So we know that the distance will lie anywhere along that direction vector. And to work out where the car is in the future, we just scale our unit direction vector by the distance that we're interested in. I think fundamentally vectors are a great way of navigating space. So in 2D we'll use 2D vectors like I have here, but the same applies to 3D as well. Now the next area I want to cover is angles. This is very basic trigonometry, and when working with angles it's useful to just memorise a few formulae. We're already now quite familiar with a right angled triangle. It can represent the distance between an enemy and a player, and it can represent a vector. The important thing is this angle here is 90 degrees. But what if we wanted to know what this angle was? This is the symbol theta, commonly used to represent angle. And as usual we've got our x-axis and our y-axis. When we look at the triangle from the perspective of this angle here, we can label the sides. The longest side of a right angle triangle is always called the hypotenuse. In this configuration, over here, the y-axis will be called the opposite side, and the x is called the adjacent. So we're looking at the triangle from this corner. And the rule I want us to learn here is that the tangent function, you'll have seen that on your scientific calculators, of theta is equal to opposite divided by adjacent. It's a ratio, and therefore we can also assume that theta is equal to the inverse tangent, the tan with a little minus 1, of the same thing. And just to just keep the writing down, I'm going to use y over x. And so that's simple enough. A hypotenuse could be a vector. We know how to calculate the length of a vector now, and we know its direction, and we know how to break it into its x and y components. We can work out the angle of that vector relative to the x-axis. Now, just a little side note. In a lot of programming languages, uh, we don't see tan uh, to the minus 1. Instead, what you'll see is a tan y divided by x. But whenever you see a divide over potentially a variable you don't have control of, we need to be sure that this x isn't equal to zero. And, well, why is this? 
we know that the internal angles of the triangle must add up to 180 degrees. And if we draw a triangle where the length x is equal to zero, well, we don't have a triangle at all. We have just a line going up. And this means this division can start to yield problems with our program. It could crash, it could make the numbers invalid. It's better if we can perform this calculation with a degree of safety. And so again, a lot of languages provide a secondary tangent function, often called a tan 2, which takes as arguments y and x. And this function performs the necessary safety checks to make sure we get an answer that we might expect. So if we were looking for the angle of a point away from the origin, in this instance we would get theta. And as the angle moves around towards y, we would hope to get here, well, 90 degrees. And the a tan 2 function will make sure that we get the result that we expect. I should also point out at this time that most programming languages don't work directly in degrees. Instead, they work in radians. And convention is to always specify these angles in radians or degrees relative to the x-axis. And as we go around, we start to form a circle. And a circle starting here is 0 degrees or 360 degrees. They're the same thing. And over here, we would have 180 degrees, 90 and 270. Whilst degrees are great for humans to understand, they're a bit naff for mathematics to understand. And instead, maths prefers pi. Don't we all? So in radians, 0 degrees is 0 radians. 180 degrees is pi. And a full circle is 2 pi, 2 times 180. And 90 degrees is pi over 2. Or if we look at that in relation to the entire circle, it's 2 pi over 4. It's the first quarter of the whole 2 pi. 180 would be 2 pi over 2. It's the first full half. 3 quarters of the way round would therefore give us 2 pi times 3 quarters, which is 6 pi over 4, which is 3 pi over 2. It's always a bit awkward, that one. But what we can see is there is a linear relationship between degrees and radians. And we can define that as being radians equals degrees divided by 180 times pi. And naturally it follows that degrees, therefore, are radians divided by pi times 180. It takes some getting used to. As humans, we like to think in terms of degrees, but the functions in our computer programs, they like to think in terms of radians. With a bit of practice and experience, eventually humans start to think in radians too. But I wanted to highlight this in case you start using some of the trigonometric functions and you're not quite getting the results you expect. Now I started this section by saying there are things you just need to memorize. And one of those things was that the tangent of theta is equal to the opposite over adjacent. And I like to remember that as TOA. Tangent of theta is equal to the opposite divided by the adjacent. TOA is one third of this phrase. So, ka, TOA. And depending on what information we have to hand, decides which part of this phrase we use for calculation. So when we knew the opposite side and the adjacent side, we can work out the missing angle with the tangent function. If we know the adjacent and the hypotenuse, then we can work out theta with the cosine function. And if all that we have is the length of the opposite side and our length of the hypotenuse, then we can work out theta with the sine function. And writing it out like this makes it a very easy thing to remember. Sokatoa. Now I've just introduced the sine and cosine functions, so let's have a think about those. Sine and cosine are periodic functions. Why they do what they do is well beyond the scope of this video, but they do have some useful properties. Here I have an axis and I've got y in the vertical direction, and I'm going to put theta, the angle, along the x. I'm going to do my very best to accurately plot y equals sine of theta. It goes up, it comes down, and it goes up again. And it'll keep doing that forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And it goes between plus 1 and minus 1. And do you know what? Just for clarity, I'll write these in in the colours. So red was sine theta. In green, on the same axis, I'm going to plot cos theta. And cos theta looks like this. 
Eh, it's not bad. And again, carries on doing its thing forever and ever and ever. Now you're thinking, why are sine and cosine important? Let's plot a second axis. Y and X. At this point here, we've done a full revolution. So this would be where the angle is 360 degrees, or of course, two pi in radians. So let's have a look where X and Y lie when we calculate X and Y using sine and cos. And I'm going to use Y is equal to sine and X is equal to cosine. Starting with a theta of zero and looking at the green line, which is our cosine in X, we can see that our X coordinate is plus one. And if we look at the red line for sine, our Y coordinate is zero. So I'm going to plot that here. It's one and zero. I'm now going to look at other locations on this plot of sine and cosine. So let's look here where it's crossed zero in the y-axis. This also happens to coincide with the peak of the sine wave. Here my x is now zero, but my y is plus one, zero comma one. Let's look at the next interesting feature, which is here, where the sine wave crosses the x-axis, also happens to be the lower peak of the cosine wave, which gives me an x of minus one and a y of zero. And no prizes for guessing, if we look at this last crossing point, we see that x, which is cosine, is zero, and our y is negative one. Now I've picked out points here that are easy to draw and represent on this axis, but if I picked every single point along this waveform, absolutely every single one, what we would find is it plots a perfect circle. As we increase theta, and this circle always has a radius equal to one. It's a unit circle. And if we think back to our vectors where we had a unit vector, it looked very similar. It was a vector pointing in a direction with a length of one. So given a specific theta, we can calculate a point in X and Y, which also happens to be a unit vector. And this is quite important because just having a theta value alone, we're able to describe a unit vector and we know that we can scale a unit vector, which will give us any point in our 2D space. This is also known as a polar coordinate. We're given any theta and any radial length, we can describe any point in 2D space. So why is this important to game developers? Well, in a similar way to our car example before, let's assume this time we have a spaceship, but all we know about this spaceship is what angle it is relative to the x-axis. We now know how to turn this angle into a direction vector for the spaceship to travel along. And it's also now very easy to rotate the spaceship because all we need to do is increase or decrease the angle. So knowing about sine, cosine and tangent, we can easily swap between using vectors and using angles. And it depends on the gameplay scenario you are trying to invent as to which approach you might prefer to use. Rotating things is certainly easier to think about when working with angles, whereas moving things along paths and in certain directions is much easier to think about using vectors. So being able to swap between the two when necessary is a requirement for most aspects of game development. However, there are some things to be aware of. Sine, cosine, tangent and square roots can all be considered quite computationally intensive i.e. they require a lot of CPU cycles in order to give you an accurate result. However, what we've seen so far with vectors, other than the square root function, vectors are trivial for a computer to compute. So where possible, we prefer to work in the domain of vectors instead of angles. And this is where another important mathematical concept which is essential for game devs is the concept of the dot product which amongst many things allows us to think about angles in terms of vectors. Here I have a space with two vectors. I'm going to call this one V1 and this one V2. And I'm interested in trying to work out the angle theta between these two vectors. Well, let's look at doing this the long way round first. I can break my vector down into a right angled triangle to give me an X and a Y component and I can use inverse tangent to give me an angle relative to the x-axis. I can do exactly the same for my other vector. Give me a big theta this time, and it should be intuitively obvious that the red theta is equal to the orange theta minus the green theta. So we can express that. So the angle between the two vectors is going to be equal to the inverse tangent of 
v2y over v2x minus the inverse tangent of v1y over v1x. But here we've got lots of things to worry about. Firstly, we've got this divide condition has come back. That's OK. You can use the ATAN2 function. Uh, then we've got these computationally expensive functions to use anyway, these inverse tangents. But we'll get the result that we want eventually. There's a slightly different way to think about solving this problem. Recall that vectors contain direction and a length, but the length is largely irrelevant in this situation. It doesn't matter how long these vectors are, the angle between them isn't going to change. So let's represent these vectors as unit vectors. The dot product is defined as being the sum of the product of the individual components of the vectors. So in this instance here, we might see v1x multiplied by v2x plus v1y multiplied by v2y. This is a scalar result. It doesn't give a vector as a result, just a single number. And let's have a look why. For the time being, I'm going to assume that our x-axis is also a unit vector. So here we've got 1, 0. So if I were to take the dot product between v1 and my x-axis, I would have v1x multiplied by 1 plus v1y multiplied by 0. Therefore, the dot product in this instance is simply the same as the x component of the vector. What we have calculated is how much does our v1 vector project onto the x-axis. And by project, what you can think of is if there was a light source casting down onto our x-axis, this line here would be where the shadow stops. And this line will always be at 90 degrees to this vector which represents our x-axis. Notice, and not uncoincidentally, we've created a right angle triangle. And in this right angle triangle, we happen to know the adjacent, we happen to know the hypotenuse, and what we're trying to calculate is the theta. So if we go back to the ka part of Sokotoa, we can see that cos theta is equal to our dot product result divided by our hypotenuse. But our hypotenuse was a unit vector, so we know its length, it's 1. Therefore, our theta is simply the inverse cosine of our dot product. We got this optimization because we moved to unit vectors. If we didn't move to unit vectors, we could still get the correct result, but we would have to use the proper length of the hypotenuse. So we would have to use Pythagoras' theorem to get that value. But this is one of the reasons I wanted to emphasize the importance of unit vectors. They can save us a lot of computation. So now we've worked out the angle of one of our vectors relative to the x-axis. We could go and do the same for our original v2. Calculate how much it projects onto the x-axis and perform a similar equation to up here where we look at the difference between those two results. However, there is no reason at all for us to project directly onto an axis. Our dot product will allow us to project one vector onto another. So assuming we want to project v2 onto v1, we want to see at what point does the shadow extend to along v1, providing we've got some light source that is perpendicular to v1. And this is precisely what the dot product calculation calculates. doesn't matter whether it's the x-axis or another vector. And so assuming we're working with unit vectors, we can calculate that angle as simply being cos to the minus 1 of the dot product between the two vectors. And that's usually represented literally by a dot. But I emphasize this is for unit vectors. If you don't have unit vectors, you're going to have to calculate the magnitudes first. Calculating the angle is all well and good, but we've got this nasty inverse cosine function to use. Now, if you do need the angle, there's no two ways about it. You've got to do this function to convert this ratio into a meaningful angle. There are intuitively other uses for the dot product scalar value that we get as a result of this calculation. Consider the following. Here I've got my x-axis, which I'm going to describe as a unit vector. And here I've got another vector, which is also a unit vector. I'm going to calculate the dot product between these two unit vectors. So we've got v dot 
large x in this case, which are both unit vectors, we'll calculate the dot product. So that's 1 times 1 plus 0 times 0 equals 1. Now let's consider our unit vector traveling along this y-axis. I'm still going to take the dot product with the x-axis. Unit vector dot x is now 0 multiplied by 1 plus 1 multiplied by 0 equals 0. Let's take a look at a final vector. Again, a unit vector. In this instance, I've got minus 1 times 1 plus 0 times 0 equals minus 1. What we've seen is as we travel around like this, we've gone from 1 through to 0 through to minus 1. I like to think of this result as how similar are two unit vectors. When they are the same, we get the result 1. When they are perpendicular to each other at 90 degrees, we get 0. And when they are in opposite directions, we get minus 1. And so if I were to have two vectors like this, they're quite similar. I'd expect my dot product between those two vectors to be somewhere near 1. If I have two vectors like this, well, they're not very similar, so I'd be expecting the dp to be somewhere around 0. And if I have two vectors like this, well, they're not similar at all. In fact, they're quite opposite, so I'd be expecting the dp to tend towards minus 1. And I find identifying the similarity between vectors to be a very important thing indeed. Let's consider a small section of racing track. And on that racing track, we've got some sort of finish line marker. And I have a car driving along the track. When the car passes this marker, I want to increase the number of laps. I know the direction vector of my car. And for this region of the track, I've specified a line that we want to cross. But I've also specified a direction vector that that line must be crossed at. In fact, it's 90 degrees. As the game is being played, at some point, the car crosses that line and we detect it. And at that point of detection, I can take the dot product between the direction of the track of the direction of my car. And I know that if my dot product result between those two vectors is greater than zero, then I have crossed the finish line the right way round. So I can increase my lap counter. However, if the direction vector of my car dot product with the track direction is less than zero, I know that they're not similar at all. And in fact, I must have crossed the finish line in completely the wrong direction. So maybe I want to decrease the number of laps. Let's consider a slightly different scenario. Here I have some terrain for a small, simple platform game. The character has a direction vector. And these segments of terrain have what's known as a normal vector. It's at 90 degrees. As my character is traveling along the terrain, I can take the dot product between the two vectors. Here we can see that they are 90 degrees to each other, so the dot product is going to be zero. And the same applies down here. But as the character gets onto the hill, the direction vectors become far more similar. They tend towards one. So I could use this number to influence the speed of my character. As it's going down the hill, it's traveling faster. Let's look at it from the other side. This time my character is trying to go up the hill. Well, now we see that we've got direction vectors which are going in opposite directions. They're not similar at all. And so in this instance, the dot product is going to tend towards minus one. So I could use this information to really slow down my character as he struggles to climb up the hill. These two examples I've shown, they're quite trivial. But knowing the similarity between vectors, and in this instance, the similarity between direction components of vectors, has a lot of utility in game development, especially when it comes to things like collision detection and physics. And we're able to calculate these reasonably complicated relationships without falling back onto any computationally intensive functions. At no point during these calculations do we actually need to know the angle of anything. We're just looking at the relationship between the two vectors, which is expressed as a scalar value, the dot product. Though please remember, everything I've shown assumes that the vectors you're using are unit vectors. The dot product can start to mean different things when you're doing the dot product between non-unit vectors. And I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of this video. Okay, another absolute mathematic essential is linear interpolation. This is also known as LERP for short, or LERPing. 
let's assume I have two points in space, P1 and P2. And I know that I want to travel from P1 to P2 in precisely five seconds. So I want to travel in this direction along that line and I want it to take me five seconds to do so. This means that every frame we're rendering the game we're going to want to render a slightly different location somewhere along this line. Now it's quite useful to think about this in terms of percentages. So when we're at the start this is going to be 0% and when we get to the end that's 100%. Halfway along that line therefore is 50%. So let's start by trying to understand where 50% along that line is and we'll call that point point T. Well let's break this down into, yep you've guessed it, a right angled triangle and we will work out where the point T is in the x-axis and the y-axis separately. So for point T in the x-axis we know at 0% we must start at P1 so it can't be any less than P1. We also know where the location is at 100% in the x-axis. Since we know the ending location in the x-axis and the starting location in the x-axis, we can work out the distance travelled in the x-axis. And 50% must be halfway along that distance, simply due to this proportionality of right angled triangles that we talked about earlier. So I can take my final point, x, work out the distance from the starting point and multiply that by t, which is my percentage. Of course, in a computer we wouldn't represent 50%, we'd represent this as 0.5, 1 and 0. Exactly the same calculation can be done for y. And so by specifying a value for parameter t between 0 and 1, we can get any location along our line. We have interpolated linearly, in a straight line, between points p1 and p2. Now let's assume that per frame 0.1 seconds of time passes and since the start of the motion I'm accumulating this time in capital T. I wanted the whole motion to take 5 seconds and therefore I'll express T over 5 as being the percentage that controls my parameter little t in my linear interpolation equations. I've taken the rather odd approach of introducing linear interpolation in two axes. The number of axes is completely irrelevant. Linear interpolation works with scalar values, vectors, multidimensional variables, it doesn't matter. The fundamental principle is this, that given two values we can find another value in between them at any point. nt equals n starting point or starting value plus n ending value, maximum value, minus the starting value multiplied by our percentage. 100% will give us the end, 0% will give us the start, and it doesn't actually have to be bound between 0 and 1. We could continue extrapolating along that line. And linear interpolation has uses all over game development, not only for controlled motion such as this, so imagine we had a sequence of vectors and we wanted to linear interpolate along each vector per frame so we got enemies that follow a path. Or perhaps we wanted to fade between different colours, we could use linear interpolation in the uh, red, green and blue spatial domain. A slightly more advanced use of linear interpolation is to implement functions that we can't define mathematically. Let's say I have some curve that looks like this. Deriving the function for that curve would be quite a challenging thing to do, but our game requires that we follow a trend of y equals f of x. If we can't define such a function easily, we can approximate it with known points that we want it to provide. These could be handcrafted. So now when we're given a specific x value and we want to look up in this function what its y value could be, we could just take the x value and round it to our nearest point, which would end up giving us something like this. The problem here is our approximation to the function isn't very smooth. A better approach would be to, given any arbitrary x value in this space, work out the two neighbouring points that we do know and linearly interpolate between them. It doesn't give us a perfect curvature, but it does remove the step-like nature of just using x on its own. So linear interpolation for approximating functions can save you the headache of deriving the function in the first place. And it's also very useful in things like audio applications and sound. 
Uh, if we assume that these were sound samples, we've taken a very crude approximation of the sound, which might end up sounding quite robotic or distorted, and instead we can access any value on that curve at any spatial resolution of x, and we linearly interpolate between the points that we know to smooth out all of these rough edges. We've just looked at how linear interpolation could be used to make uh, an enemy or a player follow a particular path. But what happens if we don't know that path in advance? For example, we have a player character running along and at some point the player presses the jump button which causes the character to jump. We haven't predefined a path in advance that we want the character to follow. But also, the path is non-trivial, it's got curvature because the world in our platform game has gravity. We can use some very simple kinematics and bring together everything we've seen in the video so far in order to solve this problem. And you might think that sounds absolutely horrific, but I think also there's a certain elegance to it when you actually see its simplicity. We can represent our player's position in space as a point, and we know that a point is also the same as a vector. As the game is progressing, time is moving forwards, and time is an important part of motion. You may remember that speed equals distance over time. And if you're not familiar with this, well, think of it in terms of miles or kilometers per hour or meters per second. And so if we happen to know the speed that we're moving at, we can rearrange this to tell us how far we've traveled in a particular time. It's simply speed times time. Now, speed on its own is a scalar value, but we've been working with vectors. So when you actually have speed in a direction, that's known as velocity. So our player should also have a velocity vector. In games, we typically chop up time into the amount of time that's passed per frame. This can be known as delta time or elapsed time. And so taking a character with a given velocity vector, how do we calculate where it should be on the next frame? Well, this is simply a matter of taking the player's current position and adding to it the distance traveled given the speed and the time. Now our speed, is not scalar, it's a velocity vector. It includes direction. But we're only going to travel a certain distance because we've got a cap on how much time we're traveling in that distance for. This means we can argue that the position of the player on the next frame is equal to the position of the player on the current frame plus the velocity of the player on the current frame multiplied by our delta time, the elapsed time between frames. So with respect to time, velocity changes position. The problem is, if our player has a velocity vector, they're just going to keep on moving in that direction. Nothing is ever going to stop them. Yes, when the user presses the jump button at a particular location, we can change the direction of our velocity vector, and potentially its magnitude, to change the position of the player in time. We can get this jump, but that's going to happen in a straight line, because nothing ever changes the velocity. Well, that's not true, is it? Because we know that we won't just keep jumping in a straight line all the way across the universe. Uh, at some point, we do actually have to come back down to Earth. And there is a force that does that called gravity. And gravity is an acceleration, and accelerations change velocity. So I'm going to use exactly the same type of formula, but this time I'm going to change my velocity on the next frame is equal to my velocity on the current frame plus an acceleration multiplied by our delta time. I can keep acceleration fixed. So for gravity, for example, it might be something like uh, there's no change in the x-axis, but it pushes us downwards in the y-axis. We can use acceleration to change velocity, and we can use velocity to change position. And this is a very nice system, because at no point do we need to know in advance where the player is going to be. So whereas before we were linearly interpolating along vectors between points, uh, now we can let the system just update itself and the character will move uh, in accordance to the motion that we've described by our acceleration and velocity vectors. I wanted to include this at the end simply because it does bring everything together. We're now working with vectors and we might be interested in changing the directions of vectors uh, based upon the landscape. Uh, or the orientation or angle of the player. And now we're equipped with all of the tools to convert between vectors and angles and understand how to work out where we are along a vector with respect to time. This video has been a brief introduction
to the essential mathematics that I believe aspiring game developers need in order to get the most out of their craft. And fundamentally, I've only talked about angles, vectors and motion. But we've seen throughout the course of this video that actually all of these are related in quite simplistic ways. And that understanding the relationships between these things allows you to make better decisions as a game developer. It's up to you to decide what to use and when to use it, but don't make life difficult for yourself by making a decision at the start, I'm only going to use angles for things, or I'm only going to use vectors for things. Uh, this video should have equipped you with some of the basic tools to translate between them. Another way to look at this if you did want to explore things a bit further is angles is all about trigonometry and vectors is really all about geometry. Motion, and I know we've only looked at it very simply, comes under kinematics or indeed plain old physics. Those of you that have been game developing already for some time or have watched a lot of the videos on my channel may notice there's one important thing missing from here and I'm not going to talk about it in this video because I've covered it in lots of other videos on this channel but that would be matrices or linear algebra. All of these things combined together give you the ability to manipulate space whether it's two dimensions or three dimensions or more. And manipulating space or manipulating things in space is fundamentally all game development is. Well, perhaps I shouldn't say all game development, but most conventional game development that involves characters, action, movement, that sort of thing. And I hope this video has provided enough confidence for people that may not have the strongest maths uh, that you don't necessarily need to know advanced maths in order to achieve quite cool things in game development. Maths certainly helps, I can't deny that, but you don't need much in order to do lots of fun stuff. If you found this video useful, a big thumbs up please, have a think about subscribing, and I'll see you next time. Take care.